heading overseas. President Joe Biden departs on his first international trip since taking office. Calls for more cooperation. A Catholic cardinal tells us what he'd like to see from lawmakers on both sides of the Atlantic. Infrastructure talks, where the debate between Congress and the White House stands tonight. And New Catholic School, how it's providing hope for people in Boston. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, June 9th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Joe Biden heads overseas to reassure European allies of the United States commitment to them. Perhaps the biggest test of his first international trip as president will come at the end of the eight days when he meets face to face with Russian President Vladimir Putin. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. President Joe Biden left the White House this morning and has since arrived. Now, he first met with U.S. troops stationed in Britain. Then tomorrow, he talks with British Prime Minister Boris Johnson ahead of the G7 summit. Before flying off to Europe, President Joe Biden swats away a cicada. Watch out for the cicadas. I just got one. Got me. But swatting away bugs may be the easiest part of the trip. His top challenge, reassure allies that the United States is a dependable partner and let them know the U.S. has their back. That and send a message to Russia and China. Strengthening the alliance, make it clear to Putin and to uh, China that Europe and the United States are tight and the G7 is going to move. The president said the recent cyber attacks, including the one that shut down Colonial Pipeline and knocked a meat processing plant offline, will be a subject of discussion with President Vladimir Putin. And when asked if he will come out with a coronavirus vaccine strategy for the world... I have one and I'll be announcing it. Thank you. In fact, the president will soon announce, according to the Washington Post, that the U.S. will buy 500 million more doses of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine to share with lower-income countries and the African Union. Another main focus, China. President Joe Biden and other G7 leaders will announce an infrastructure financing program. It's for developing countries and aimed at competing directly with Beijing. While in Brussels, President Biden is also scheduled to meet with Turkey's president. Back in April, President Biden told the Turkish leader that he would formally recognize the killings of Armenians last century by Ottoman Empire forces as genocide. The White House had avoided using that term for decades over concerns of alienating Turkey. Now, back to the cicadas for a moment. Reporters covering the presidential trip overseas, while their chartered plane was delayed today by seven hours because it was overrun by cicadas. Experts say there are trillions of them in the Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. area. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, before his international trip, President Biden cut off negotiations for a bipartisan deal on infrastructure with a group of six Senate Republicans led by Senator Shelley Moore Capito. He is now shifting his focus to a coalition of moderate senators from both parties in the hopes of keeping a compromise alive. So what's next? Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. In Washington, we know relationships come and go. Now President Biden has turned his focus on a group of senators known as the G20, a group of 10 Democrats and 10 Republicans who pride themselves on moving past partisan stalemates to make a deal. The group led by Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona and Republican Senator Rob Portman hope that they can reach a deal with President Biden. Sources tell me the group is interested in an eight-year infrastructure bill around a trillion dollars, much less than the president's $1.7 trillion offer. But Republicans say no deal for tax hikes. The last thing we want to do in an infrastructure package is to hurt the economy. As we come out of COVID, we want to actually help to keep the economy moving in the right direction. Republican Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee tells me the issue still boils down to what is infrastructure. We support hard infrastructure, the type of infrastructure like bridges, roadways, airports, waterways, even broadband. These are investments that have a real return on investment for our taxpayers. 
Republicans tell me they hope it will not be a repeat of previous negotiations. One Republican staff member saying just when they thought they had a deal with the president on an item, his staff came in and moved the goal line. Meanwhile, Democratic leadership is floating the idea of passing a smaller bipartisan infrastructure bill with Republican support, then passing a much larger Democratic-only bill that includes most of what the president is pushing. We all know as a caucus we will not be able to do all the things that the country needs in a totally bipartisan, in a bipartisan way. And so at the same time, we are pursuing um, the, the uh, pursuit of reconciliation. I just spoke with Senator Romney this afternoon, and he tells me that there are a number of line items in the Republicans' proposal that deal with climate change, such as hydrogen and nuclear power and CO2 emissions from pipelines. But he adds and affirms that Democrats will likely pass a much larger infrastructure bill on their own much later. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, we have an update now on a story that we brought you yesterday about sanctuary cities for the unborn. Last night, Sundown, Texas, became the 31st sanctuary city for the unborn. Mark Lee Dixon, founder of the Pro-Life Initiative, sent these photos from the meeting that made the news official. The 31 cities are in Texas, Nebraska, and Ohio. A new poll examines the attitudes of Americans toward life issues. According to the survey by Gallup, a record high 47 percent of Americans think abortion is morally acceptable. That is up five percentage points in just two years and the highest number Gallup has recorded. 46 percent say abortion is morally wrong. Joining us now to discuss these numbers is Michael New, associate scholar at the Charlotte Lozier Institute and research associate at the Catholic University of America. Michael, welcome back. Always great to see you. Uh, according to the Gallup survey, the number of Americans who consider abortion to be morally acceptable is at an all-time high. Do you think this is an accurate assessment of Americans' attitudes on abortion? And if so, why do you think that is? What has caused this shift? Well, I really don't think there's really been that big a shift. If you look at the other questions in this Gallup survey, I really think what you see is a lot of stability. Uh, they asked the pro-life, pro-choice question. 47% uh, of Americans identified as pro-life. 49% uh, identified as pro-choice. If you kind of look back at previous Gallup surveys, 47% uh, is very average for pro-life sentiment. That was the average of the past five Gallup surveys. So I think really what this poll shows is a lot of stability on attitudes on sanctity of life issues. Michael, as far as the survey, uh, what else jumped out at you and what surprised you? I think the best finding for pro-lifers is that 52 percent of all Americans, a majority, think that abortion should either be illegal or legal in only a few circumstances. So there is actually a pro-life majority for a lot of the incremental sorts of pro-life laws that uh, we want to pass. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing that's always important to know is we've seen some long-term gains in pro-life sentiment. Uh, a Gallup poll that was taken in 1995 showed that only 33 percent of Americans identify as pro-life. Another poll taken in 1996 showed that only 37 percent of Americans identified as pro-life. So in 25 years, uh, we have made some real gains. Uh, pro-life sentiment is consistently in the high 40s, so our educational efforts have paid off. And, and what do you think are the big takeaways uh, from this Gallup poll? Uh, I think that uh, the main takeaway is stability. Uh, I think if you look at the broad contours of public opinion, uh, that you see a lot of support for a lot of the issues that are going to be discussed in the coming years. Uh, the Biden administration tragically uh, submitted the budget uh, that did not include the Hyde Amendment. I think this is something pro-lifers should certainly um, you know, make people aware of, uh, that most Americans do not want their taxpayer dollars paying for abortion. Uh, all Supreme Court, as your viewers know, is going to hold hearings on a case involving a 15-week abortion ban in Mississippi. Uh, limits on second and, th second and third trimester abortions consistently pull well. So I think on a lot of the current, current policy issues are being debated. Uh, Americans stand with pro-lifers. And, Michael, what do you think can and should be done to help change attitudes towards abortion and better promote the sanctity of life? Well, it's glad you asked that. Uh, Susan B. Anthony List uh, did a poll, which we released earlier last week, and we found that when people just learn more about abortion, they're a lot more sympathetic to pro-life laws. We found that people would be a lot more likely to support a 15-week abortion ban if they're aware of fuel development, if they're aware that unborn children can feel pain, 
and also if they're aware of the psychological, mental, and physical health risks involved with abortion. So more information tends to lead people to a more pro-life position. Well, Michael, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate you coming on. Michael New, Associate Scholar, Charlotte Lozier Institute, and Research Associate at the Catholic University of America. Thank you again. Thank you. A national pro-life group finds majority support for a 15-week abortion ban. The findings are in a new Susan B. Anthony List poll, which Michael New just mentioned. 55% of likely voters say that they would be more likely to endorse restrictions once knowing that the developing unborn child has a heartbeat and can feel pain. For more details on this pro-life story, visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com. A pro-life campaign in Poland champions the dignity of children diagnosed with medical conditions before birth. Ten aborcyjny wybór zawsze ma twarz konkretnej osoby. It is called Every Life is a Miracle. The campaign tells the stories of children born with disabilities, often after doctors advised an abortion. Foundation Pro Elio Group is celebrating life in the wake of last fall's ruling by Poland's high court, which ruled that abortion due to fetal abnormalities is unconstitutional. Well, the Vatican has cleared a Polish prelate of negligence in connection with the handling of two clergy abuse cases. Accusations against Archbishop Stanislaw Gadecki were deemed unfounded after a three-year investigation. Archbishop Ivan Yurkovich meets with Pope Francis in two weeks in preparation to become Canada's new apostolic nuncio. I certainly expect from him uh, some very specific instructions. Also, if regarding the difficult situation in Canada for the time being, and all the events that we well know, we, it's very well known to us from the past. Our colleague Christian Peshkin of EWTN Germany spoke with His Excellency in Geneva. Coming up. The Archdiocese of Boston is set to open its first new school in decades. We have reaction. Oxford University continues to grapple with symbols of Britain's colonial history. An effort to remove a Cecil Rhodes statue was recently overruled. Today, a student group voted to remove a portrait of Queen Elizabeth II from a college common room. Their decision is drawing considerable reaction. Well, the Archdiocese of Boston is set to open its first new school in 50 years. Lumen Verum Academy will feature a combination of online and in-person instruction. It is slated to open this fall with around two dozen students in grades 6 through 8. Lumen Verum, or True Light, will eventually expand to add high school and hopefully enroll about 400 students. And joining us now is Thomas Carroll, Superintendent for Catholic Schools in the Archdiocese of Boston. Superintendent Carroll, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back. First off, congratulations on the new school. Wonderful news. Um, it seems that this is a sign that there is a real need for Catholic education in Boston. What have you heard from the community, and do you see this new school as a sign of hope for Catholic schools in Boston and elsewhere? It reflects a sense of optimism that we have coming out of last year. Uh, we, as, as you know from prior conversations, gained since last July almost 4,000 new students. Uh, and that's after a very long period of time, decades of decline. And so there's a sense of optimism that more people understand the value proposition of a Catholic school, uh, that the combination of faith, high quality, small, strong community setting, uh, is really important to a lot of people and something that we should treasure. So based on that optimism, uh, we're now, uh, for the first time in just over 50 years, are creating a brand new school. As you indicated, partly it's uh, online, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, or online instruction. That allows us to not only provide uh, instruction to people across the entire archdiocese, which is a pretty large geographic territory, the largest district in a sense in the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But it also allows us to bring in distinguished guest lecturers, uh, people like George Weigel, Mary Hassan, 
uh, Edward Habsburg, who's the ambassador from Hungary to the Vatican and so forth. So the, the entire English-speaking world becomes an extended uh, opportunity for us to elevate the intellectual play within the school. And then because we're focused, obviously, on evangelizing children, and so that requires personal encounter. And so we have about 18 or so hours per week that are instruction, including mass and adoration, but also a lot of interactive activities. So children will have a chance to socialize with each other in a very intense way, but in an educationally focused way, as well as many field trips and athletic activities. Okay. The one thing that we learned coming out of the pandemic okay. is the importance of in-person instruction. And that is so incredible. I know something else that's really different um, is the actual school day. I understand students will be taught between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., mirroring uh, traditional work hours. Tell us why you decided to make that change, and do you think that will be effective? Yeah, I've actually opened schools uh, in, in a charter school context in a, a previous uh, job uh, that had 9 to 5 school days. And particularly for high school kids, and this ultimately will be a 6 through 12 high school, there's a lot of research about uh, kids being a lot more productive. Their sleep schedules change, their sleep cycles change as they go through adolescence. And so a later start to the day makes them more engaged, kind of more awake, uh, as anyone who has teenage kids who like to sleep late understands. But at the same time, it reduces a lot of stress when you're, you have families that are working, either one or both members of a family. And we also, within that nine to five day, we start the day with morning prayer, the noon angelus, and then we end the day with an examine and the act of contrition every single day. And then in the in-person days, we do uh, mass or Eucharistic adoration on both the Wednesday and Saturday in-person days. And then during the day, we start off with student preparation periods, getting ready for Socratic style small group discussions. And then we roll into the small group discussions. So we cap classroom screen time so it's not too much for any kid. And at the same time, we cap the amount of time that kids listen to lectures. And that's because in many ways, lectures, uh, particularly if you do them one after another after another all day long, uh, you quickly reach a point of diminishing returns. It's not the most effective way to get kids to remember content. So we're trying to innovate in a lot of different ways, make the instruction uh, much more exciting than it is in a typical American school, but at the same time be in complete 100% fidelity with the magisterium of the Catholic Church. Our number one goal above anything else is making sure that when a child enters our school in sixth grade, that when they leave our school, they graduate in 12th grade, that their faith will be enriched and deepened, not destroyed over that time period. Oh, that is so wonderful. And thank you so much for coming on and, and talking to us about this. And again, congratulations on this school. Thomas Carroll, Superintendent for Catholic Schools for the in the Archdiocese of Boston. Thank you. A retired nun in Los Angeles has agreed to plead guilty to federal charges of embezzling more than $800,000, allegedly, to mass casino gambling and personal expenses. 79-year-old Mary Margaret Cooper had been a school principal. She could face time in prison. Up next, international relations. A Catholic cardinal tells EWTN News Nightly about the importance of transatlantic ties. And the Holy Father's message. Pope Francis identifies a source of strength. Catholic bishops from Europe and the United States are calling for greater cooperation between lawmakers from both areas. Ahead of the U.S.-EU summit this month, the church leaders call for, quote, the EU and the U.S. to be beacons of trust across the global community and engines for a reinvigoration of multilateral cooperation. Joining us from Rome is Cardinal Jean-Claude Olerich, Archbishop of Luxembourg and President of the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the EU. Your Eminence, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, tell us, why was it important for you and the bishops from the United States to release this letter? So it's very important to have this letter because we know that the heads 
of the United States of America, President Biden, and the authorities of the European Union will meet. And it's good that they know the positions of the bishops, of the faithful, so that they can act, listen to it, and take this into consideration for their political action. And we know that uh, you were in Rome for meetings with officials from the Vatican. Uh, can you tell us what those meetings mm -hmm. are about? Oh, they are regular meetings. We have once a year to meet heads of different dicasteries, but especially also to meet the Cardinal uh, Secretary of State, Cardinal Parolin, because he's our counterpart uh, in the Vatican. And of course, we are always very happy to meet Pope Francis, who encourages us. And uh, it's good to work for this church. And I understand uh, this year the European Union is celebrating 50 years of relations with the Holy See. Tell us about that relationship and what you're looking forward to in the near future between the EU and the Vatican. So I think the Vatican and the European Union have a very good relation. Uh, we wanted to celebrate this 50 years anniversary in Brussels with a visit of Cardinal Parolin. So the visit became, got virtual because of the pandemia we are in. But I think that most politicians uh, have a high esteem for Pope Francis. And just as uh, Miss von der Leyen, the president of the commission, has visited the Vatican, uh, the president of the parliament will follow end of this month. So they really seek not only to meet the pope, but to get his advice on the political situation uh, we are in. And your eminence, uh, before we let you go, could you give us sort of an overview of how the church is doing right now in Europe? So we are a very humble church. I think uh, we cannot have masses as we used to have them. In Luxembourg, for instance, we are limited to 150 people with a two meters distance. And, uh, but we got used to it. We are more present on the new media. But I think also that all the cultural Catholics who just went to church because they were used to it, they have stopped and they will not come back. So we will have a church a little bit smaller, but more convinced and more centered on faith. And I think we have the International Eucharistic Congress in Budapest in September. That will be a wonderful occasion to get together and to give really a new push for evangelization on this old continent. Well, Your Eminence, thank you so much for your time today and for everything you do. Cardinal Jean-Claude Olerich, President of the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the EU. Thank you again. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And finally tonight, Pope Francis says constant prayer every day can keep the flame of Christian life burning. È disumano essere talmente assorbiti dal lavoro da non trovare più il tempo per la preghiera. At his weekly talk with pilgrims at the Vatican, the Holy Father says perseverance in prayer is so important in bringing us closer to God. He also says there can be an inner balance between work and prayer, and ultimately we will find help and strength if we can pray more often throughout the day. Well, we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.